I'm going to get the day right. Happy Tuesday. And for those of you who are jet lag, I feel your pain. Um, okay, let's get going. The President and Speaker McCarthy had a productive meeting yesterday about the need to prevent a default and avoid a catastrophe, I'm sorry, catastrophe, pardon me, for our economy. They both reiterated that default is off the table and only way forward is good faith, uh, good faith, is in good faith and toward a bipartisan budget agreement. While areas of disagreement remain, the President, the Speaker, and their teams will continue to discuss the path forward. Over the past week, the President's negotiating team has proposed options to reduce the deficit that both parties can support, <laughs> while also making clear that there are fundamental priorities that must be pr protected in this process. Everyone understands that the consequences of a first ever default would be severe for the American people and the American economy. It would wipe out as many as 8 million jobs, trigger a recession, devastate retirement accounts, increase costs, damage our international reputation. All of this would undermine the historic economic progress we've made under this president this past two years. 12.7 million jobs, 3.4% unemployment rate, a made in America manufacturing boom, $1.7 trillion in deficit reduction, which is a record. America is not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills. We have never defaulted in our history, and we will never. Lastly, President Biden has made tackling the mental health crisis, particularly among our youth, a top priority. Sadly, there is undeniable evidence that social media was negatively affected youth mental health, has negatively affected youth mental health. Research shows that anxiety, depression, sadness, and suicidal thoughts are on the rise. Today, during National Mental Health Awareness Month, the Biden-Harris administration is announcing the development of a new interagency task force on kids on night health and safety, and a series of additional actions from several agencies to safeguard children's privacy, mental health, and safety online. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy also released a new advisory on social media in youth mental health that calls on policymakers, technology companies, researchers, parents, and young people to work together to make social media safer for kids. These new administration-wide actions will help advance President Biden's national strategy to tackle the mental health crisis and protect the health and well-being of our nation's young people. As we continue to mark Mental Health Awareness Month, the Biden-Harris administration remains committed to ending this crisis and ensuring everyone can access the care they need to live full and happy lives. With that, Chris, you want to take kick us off, please? Yeah, a few questions of the budget negotiations. Sure. Uh, Republicans have said the White House has shown a lack of urgency around negotiations. Uh, we're nine days into the month, and under House rules, uh, it could take four days to get a deal on the floor for a vote. Uh, the Speaker wants a deal to be cut this week. What is the White House's deadline for reaching a deal to get it for a vote? Time? So, look, as I as I stated, uh, the um, the conversations, as the Speaker has stated, as we have stated, have been productive, which is important. Uh, clearly, that uh, we're moving forward. As I think, just moments ago, uh, the team, uh, the teams uh, who are uh, the team from the White House, who were on the Hill uh, for the budget negotiation, that just ended. They met for hours, and so they're going to be returning and clearly give uh, the, the President an update. But look, this is uh, this is this is a, this is urgent. Uh, but this is not political. This is about doing the work of and the business of the American people. This is something that we have said over and over for, again for the past five months, that this is, uh, this is for Congress to act. This is their constitutional duty. So we've been very clear, uh, uh, and we've, been, we've shown urgency from here. And uh, look, we think Republicans saying uh, that, uh, that uh, the White House is not showing any urgency is a ridiculous question, is a ridiculous statement for them to be making. And so we've been saying this for months. Congress must ask. Congress needs to act. And we'll continue to lay the line on that. So oftentimes when these meetings happen, uh, the White House or other parties call them productive. 
that's the word is often used. But can you say that we're actually closer to, to, to a deal now than we were last week? So what I can say is reiterate what the president and the speaker said. The speaker said this yesterday, that they these talks, these conversations, the conversation yesterday was productive. And I think that's important when you're hearing that in these types of negotiations, as we know, are very difficult, right, negotiations. This is nothing new. They are incredibly tough. Uh, and so when you hear it from both sides saying that they're productive, I think that's an important statement. Uh, I'm just not going to uh, get into any further details. And the last question is, uh, the Treasury is looking for ways to delay certain payments. Uh, is the administration trying to push back the X date? Uh, is there potential that a deal won't be reached and you're going to need to kind of juggle the, these payments to, to make so Make look, anything, anything uh, uh, re relating to the X date or uh, that that is um, concerning how to move forward here as it relates to that, I would refer you to the Treasury Department on their communications with the agency. That is something that they uh, would certainly lay out. As the Treasury said yesterday, it's important to have accurate information about inflows and outflows to the government so they can continue to uh, produce an accurate forecast for Congress of when cash and extraordinary measure expire. So this sort of commun communication is actually consistent with prior uh, debt limit impasses. So that is something for sure that the Treasury Department will have more to share on. Go ahead, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we keep hearing these optimistic statements. You've noted you know, the meeting was productive, but we aren't seeing any actual progress. In fact, the Speaker just said we are nowhere near a deal. So why the optimism? Look, if everyone is working in good faith uh, and uh, recognizes that uh, uh, no one is going to get, either side is going to get exactly what they want, we'll get it done. That's the way we see this. Uh, coming out of the meeting yesterday, we said this, uh, the President said this, we, the, both the President and the Speaker reiterated that the fault is off the table. So now we have to uh, do this in good faith, we have to move forward. I believe the team has been meeting for a couple of hours uh, this morning. They, as I just said, they just, uh, they just uh, 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 ended their, their conversation from this morning. They met until late into the evening last night. So that is important. That is good. We're seeing movement. I'm just not going to get into specifics of where we are. Uh, we believe that this should get done as soon as possible. And again, they've been productive. We've heard that from the speaker. We've heard that from the president. Uh, the meetings continue to occur and happen with the, on the staff level, and we're happy to see that. I think we're trying to understand what does productive mean? I mean, do you agree with the speaker that you're nowhere near a deal right now? Look, I'm going to let the speaker speak for himself. What I can say is, uh, and what the President and reiterate what the President has said. I have not gotten a download, obviously, uh, from uh, from this morning's meeting. Uh, the President's going to get uh, certainly an update from his team, his no negotiation team, uh, once they get back and, and there's a moment to do so on the President's schedule. Uh, from, from what I know, from what I can tell you at this moment, uh, the meeting that the President had with the Speaker yesterday was indeed uh, productive, uh, and uh, we're going to continue to let uh, the staffers, the negotiation, the negotiation teams uh, continue to have this conversation and and, uh, and and meet. And just one more, what do you say to Americans who see that we are nine days out and they are genuinely, you know, concerned and worried about how this will impact them? How worried should Americans be right now? Look, uh, this is something that the president has been saying for months, for five months now, how it is important for Congress to act, how it is important uh, for, for them to do their constitutional duty is to deal with the debt limit. We've been very clear because we've laid out, I just laid out at the top, what this could trigger if we don't indeed uh, meet that X date that the Treasury Department has laid out uh, for not just for us, for all Americans. And so, look, if you're thinking about millions of Americans losing jobs, yeah, that's concerning. A potential uh, uh, triggering of, of a recession, yes, that's concerning. If you think about how this would take back uh, all the uh, progress that we've made in the last two years with this president, we think about 12.7 million jobs, we think about uh, unemployment at 3.4 percent, which is uh, the lowest that we've seen uh, in, his in history. All of the gains that we have made to get the economy back on, our on its feet, uh, yeah, we can see that go away. So that's why the president has been meeting uh, with the leaders uh, in, in Congress, and specifically yesterday with the speaker, and having that conversation to continue to show the urgency that we have. But it's been for five months, five months that we've been saying this.
Kent Steve. Does the President plan to talk to Speaker McCarthy today? I don't have any calls to uh, read out to you uh, for the for the President to speak to the to Speaker McCarthy. I can tell you for sure that he will be getting a, a download from his negotiation team uh, once uh, once there's a moment on his calendar to do so. Representative Patrick McHenry said last night that nothing is agreed to until everything's agreed to. Is that your understanding as well? So what I'll say is this, and and this is what I've been saying for the past couple of days. I said this when we were kind of on the other side of the world doing a, a press briefing for all of you in, in Japan. And we have said, negotiation, I said, negotiations are very hard. They're very difficult. Both sides have to understand that they're not going to get everything that they want. And what we're trying to get to is a budget that is reasonable, that that is bipartisan, that that Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate uh, will be able to vote on and agree on. So this is uh, this is the process that that's why we're moving in this way to make sure that it's bipartisan but also reasonable. And so that's what uh, that's what you all can look forward to. Has there been any more discussion about the 14th Amendment? Look, you know, uh, the president's been very clear uh, about this. He's spoken to this. It is just not uh, it is not going to. Um, deal with the problem that we're currently having at this moment, at this time. What we need to focus on is Congress acting, is Congress doing their constitutional duty, and dealing with uh, the debt limit. Okay, Thanks, Karine. Um, so we are nine days away from the U.S. potentially defaulting, and as was previously noted, it's going to take several days for legislation to actually get passed through the Congress. So at what point, how many days do we have left until we are in full crisis mode? So look, uh, the Treasury Department has laid that out. They put out an X date. That's something that I would refer to them as far as what does that look like uh, and the specific and any information. What I can tell you is what we're going to continue to do here every day. Our team, our negotiating team, is going to, on a daily basis, multiple, multiple times a day, ha have that meeting and conversation and discussion with uh, with the negotiators on the Hill to, to get to a, a budget, uh, budget deal, a bipartisan, a bipartisan uh, deal that is reasonable so that the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans in both chambers can vote on and deal with. So that's our promise. That's what we're going to deal with. As far as what's going to happen and, and the specifics, that's something that the Treasury uh, should deal yeah, with no, and, and I, speak to. I understand to. that. And obviously, the, the, the date could potentially mm -hmm. move slightly based on the Treasury's estimates. But for the markets that are watching, for Americans who are waiting for their Social Security checks, for their veterans' benefits, who are waiting to see what's going to happen, can you provide them a sense of, of how much cushion you have, how many days before that X date do you actually need a deal? That is, again, for the state, uh, the Treasury Department to well, speak no, it's to. for them to determine the date, but for how many but days you need is, to get but, legislation. But any, any contingency, anything that's related to that, that is for the Treasury Department to speak to. What I can speak to is this budget negotiation and what we have been doing, what we have been calling on Congress to do for the past five months is to act. And so we're going to continue to have those conversations. We believe they've been productive. We believe there is a space and an opportunity here to have a bipartisan, reasonable, reasonable budget agreement that, again, the House and the Senate uh, can vote on and that we can get the business of the American people done. And on the, on the specifics here, the, the Speaker and his team have said that the federal government needs to spend less money next year than it is spending this year, meaning that they need cuts, not just a freeze in the way the White House has suggested. Is that a red line for the White House, or are you guys willing to entertain a budget for next year and the coming years that is less than fiscal year 2023? So look, Jeremy, I'm not going to negotiate from here. Uh, I'm going to let the negotiation team uh, speak to that. The President was very clear on Sunday. Uh, we put forward a proposal that cut spending uh, by more than $1 trillion. That is on top of, on top of the budget that the President put out on March 9th that, that showed uh, more uh, up to $3, thri $3 trillion nearly $3 trillion uh, more in, uh, in, uh, in budget, uh, budget um, dealing with the budget cut, uh, to cut the deficit, to be more specific. And that was in his budget. So he called for another trillion dollars on top of that. And so, look, that's where we are. I'm not going to go into the details or the specifics from here, uh, but you heard directly from the President on Sunday, and that's what he laid out. And then just quickly, um, just wanted to ask you for an update on the situation that happened last night at Lafayette Park. A U-Haul crashed into the bollards at the north end of the park uh, just before 10 p.m. Can you tell us how quickly the President was informed of the situation? Was he moved to 
a secure location where any protective measures taken. So look, I can tell you this, uh, and I want to be really careful here. This is something that the Secret Service, uh, uh, w I would refer you to for any information uh, that they can share, specific information. That's where they would share that. I can share with you that the President was indeed briefed, he was briefed this morning, on what's known by Secret Service and the, pol and the Park Police uh, thus far. He's relieved that no one was injured last night and grateful to the agents and the law enforcement officer who responded in so quickly. Uh, again, I would refer you to the Secret Service. He wasn't informed last night. Uh, I can tell you, right, he was briefed this morning. That's when he got the briefing from both uh, Secret Service and the Park Police on what they know thus far. Uh, clearly, the President was here yesterday working at the White House, so of course he was here last night. Uh, but I can tell you that he was briefed by both uh, the relevant, uh, relevant uh, agencies, if you will, law enforcement uh, agencies who had to deal with the situation, and he's very thankful for to them for their quick response uh, on this particular issue issue. Just to be clear on timing, is any date before June 1st in your eyes good enough to get this thing done? Look, we have to get this done. That's what I can I tell the you. Is, is, I, is, I, is like asking Friday me, the goal, you're Saturday asking the goal? For a date. I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to get into dates. What I can say there's an urgency. We want to see this done as soon as possible as it relates to the debt limit. The, the teams are going to uh, meet on a regular basis multiple times a day to deal with the budget negotiations and this could be, you know, this could be done today well, actually. I guess the reason I ask is because there've been ram ramifications before. We've witnessed this back Absolutely. in 2011. It went down Absolutely. to the wire. They still beat the X date. They still got the debt limit raised at the last minute, but then and days later, later, the credit rating was downgraded. How confident are you that given the dysfunction we've witnessed here, it going down to the wire, our credit rating would not be downgraded? Look, this is why the President has, Peter, this is why the President for the last five months has stated how important and how critical it is to get this done, how critical it is for con Congress to do their constitutional duty. This is why you have heard an echo from here over and over and a repetitive one of how we see, how we think and believe this should have moved forward. It didn't happen, so how Confident are you that we are right? look we from as from what we see and what has been happening in these budget negotiations in these conversations we see these conversations going moving in a productive way that is important and we'll get there it has to be a bipartisan right it has to be a bipartisan right. reasonable uh, budget negotiation let me ask you yesterday we heard from Speaker Agreement. McCarthy multiple times spoke multiple times in the morning spoke multiple times after the meeting took place we heard from the president very briefly during the meeting for Americans that feel like they're not hearing from the president regularly not hearing from the vice president regularly not hearing from cabinet officials right now. Where is the messaging from the White House on this beyond at this podium? Well, you've heard from the president multiple times over the weekend. You've heard from the president multiple times during the last five months. Uh, he has been very clear. You've heard from me. You've heard from others. We've had our e economic team out there talking about this on your network, on other networks. Uh, and so we've been very clear for the past five months. I wouldn't just look at the last couple of days, the past five months, consistently, consistently. Uh, you've so heard from this president. Like it's winning the messaging war on this. I mean, look, what we have been very clear. I know folks have asked me, uh, you know, uh, about uh, about this in the past, and what we saw in 2011 is that, and in polling showed showed this that the GOP was blamed for that. That's how the Americans the Americans saw uh, saw the outcome of the debt limit there and what was happening with the negotiations back then. That's what the polling showed. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to either speak speak from here almost every day. We have speak from here about, about what's going on. You've heard from the President. You've heard from the economic team. You've heard from Democrats, the leadership in, in, in the House, uh, in the Senate talks speak to this about the urgency, about Congress mm -hmm. actually needing to act and doing their constitutional duty. Last one. is the pre You said that if both sides are working in good faith, this will get done. Does the President believe that Kevin McCarthy is working in good faith. What the president believes is that the conversations have been productive, and that is important. And just to reiterate this, negotiations are hard. They're not easy. This is democracy in action as we have seen it, as we have looked at what's been going on these past couple of days and weeks. And what both sides need to understand is neither side is going to get exactly what they want. But what we need to have is a bipartisan, reasonable uh, budget agreement, and that's what we're so working clear, towards. You didn't say the president thinks Kevin McCarthy is acting I, in good Look, faith. I, I, what, I th what I said is that it were, if everyone keeps working in good faith. So, yes, we believe that uh, that, that is what is happening. There is a good faith effort here. We just have to continue to do that. We have to keep doing that, uh, and then we can get into uh, we can get into a, a bipartisan, reasonable uh, budget agreement. Thank you. Great. I'm gonna go to that. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, right with me or behind? No. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, 
are the negotiators going to meet again today? Uh, the the House negotiating team came out and seemed pretty down on the state of things um, and weren't even sure there would be a meeting. Do you have any sense from the so White House I, side? Since it just ended right before I came out, I don't have an update on a meeting for today. As you know, they met, I think, almost till midnight, around 11 o'clock last night, and then they met again almost 12 hours later. Uh, this is the budget negotiation team, just to be very specific here. They went up to the Hill and they had a meeting for hours that lasted clearly more than two hours. I just don't have any update if this is going to, if they're going to uh, uh, go back to the Hill later today. I can tell you this, that the president is certainly going to get a download uh, from, from the budget negotiation team did, today. Did the president and Speaker McCarthy have an agreement to talk on the phone or in person on a daily basis? I think uh, Speaker McCarthy implied that that would happen. Um, and so do they have an agreement? And <laughs> is it going to happen? I can say this, uh, don't have any meetings or calls uh, to announce, uh, but obviously the staff is going to continue to have this conversation. They just fit, they just wrapped up a, a conversation moments ago, and the president will speak uh, to the speaker when it's necessary. I just don't have anything to share at this time. Okay. Thank you. I know the president is busy with the debt negotiations, but uh, what is the uh, directions or messages he has given to his team for preparing for the state visit next month? So, um, as you know, the President uh, and the First Lady are looking forward uh, to welcoming uh, Prime Minister Modi for the official state visit, which is, as we announced, is going to happen on June 22nd. And I'll say more broad broadly, as we have already shared, uh, when we announce uh, the visit, uh, this will be an opportunity to reaffirm uh, the deep and close partnership between the United States and India and uh, the warm bonds of the f of family and friendship that link Americans and clearly Indians, uh, Indians together. And so that's a very important to the President. The visit will also strengthen our two countries' shared commitment to a free, open, prosperous and secure Indo-Pacific and shared resolve to, our, to evaluate our st strategic uh, technology partnership, including in defense, clean energy, and space. Uh, don't have anything else to preview. Clearly, as we get closer, uh, June 20, 22nd is, is, is very far <laughs> away uh, on our calendar. And so once we get closer to the 22nd, surely we'll uh, hold background calls and have more, more information and more details to share. And secondly, uh, in, uh, in Japan, when President met the Prime Minister, he told the Prime Minister that he has been receiving a lot of, flooded with a lot of uh, requests to be invited for the state dinner during those days. Uh, Say that one more time. I guess the President told the Prime Minister in Hiroshima when they met that he is being flooded with a lot of requests for the invitations to attend the state dinner. Who's he? Which? The President. The President. I'm, I'm, can you just say that one more time? Uh, it has been reported in the media yeah. that the President told the Prime Minister that he is being flooded with a lot of invitations, requests to be invited for the state dinner. For, for the Japanese President to be, the Prime, sorry, the Japanese Prime Minister oh, being. Prime oh. Oh, you're talking about India. Okay. I'm okay. I'm not quite <laughs> Yes, one more time. I don't know if you're talking about the the Japanese prime the, the Yes, met was the Indian in prime minister. Oh, okay, Indian prime minister. He he told the prime minister that he's quite popular in the US because he's been receiving a lot of requests Got from it. Indian Americans to be invited for the state dinner. Got it. Okay. That's good. <laughs> That's a good thing. I mean, I don't have a list of requests. I mean, it sounds like it was coming from the, from, from Prime, the Prime Minister. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I mean, you would have so to ask. Being held in the dining room. Or the I don't have more. Line. I don't have more to share. I really don't. I think that's a good thing that shows the excitement of uh, of uh, the Prime Minister being here on the June twenty second. We I just talked about laid laid out how the the important relationship that uh, that we have. Uh, with India and how we want to continue to grow that partnership, grow that relationship. Uh, I think that's a good thing uh, to get those requests. I think that's important and shows how, uh, why uh, it is critical to continue growing that partnership that we have with India. Thank you. All Thanks. right. <laughs> Sorry, it took a little bit to get to to get to that. Good Thank Alice. you so much. Uh, so the, the president just came back from the G7, and there is no other G7 country that goes through such that saining drama on a regular basis. So how concerned is he that even if he's able to strike a deal, uh, this will undermine the dollar's reputation, this will undermine the UN United States you know, standing on the international business scene? Well, look, at the top of the briefing, I laid out uh, what would uh, potentially occur if we didn't uh, lift the debt limit, if we didn't make the X date, and it would undermine our uh, global kind of how, we, how we're seen uh, globally. 
And, uh, and so, yeah, that is, that is important to note as we're moving forward and going through, uh, going through the next couple of days and trying to, uh, trying to get the debt limit. But even no, if, you know, a deal is found that it already calls into question. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not certainly not going to get into hypotheticals from here. What I can say is uh, what uh, experts have said, what the economists have said, and how uh, it, it is important uh, to get this done and how detrimental it could be if we don't deal with the debt limit in a, in a time that exp that's expedient, right? And that's why we have said, could lose 8 million jobs, uh, uh, potentially. We can see a trigger, uh, could trigger uh, the, uh, a recession. All of those things are real and are standing uh, globally, right? One of, the, one of the important parts of the President going to the G7 is strengthening our, the global economy, right? That is incredibly important. Those, those G7 leaders are the largest economies uh, across the globe, and so, of course, it is important how we're viewed, how we're seen. We're going to try and work very hard to get this done. And um, But at the end of the day, we've been holding the line very strongly, which is Congress needs to act. This is something, uh, when it comes to the debt limit, that they need to get done. And so we're going to continue uh, continue to hold that line very clearly. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Karina. I want to follow up on Steve's question from earlier. It sounds like the White House is now ruling out invoking the 14th Amendment as an option to get around the debt ceiling. Is that accurate? What I can say, it, it is not. It is not. Uh, it is not going to fix the, the current problem that we have right now. Which right now, what we what is going to deal uh, with getting the debt limit done is for Congress uh, for for Congress to act, and that's what we've been very clear so on. If it's the current problem, that means that's not a possibility that the president. Will I mean, I, look. Uh, I, look, I. I'm not going to go beyond what the president has said. Very clear, it's not going to solve our problems. That is, uh, that is just where we are. Congress needs to do its job. Uh, they need to uh, do a job that has been happening since 1960, which is lifting uh, the debt limit more than 78 times. That's what we are focused on. That's how we're going to move forward. Thanks. Yeah, Karen. Um, thanks, Karen. Uh, tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the school shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, just a couple questions. Has the president spoken recently with any of the families of the vic victims there? And how will he mark tomorrow, if at all? And, and what's his message to the families and the nation at this anniversary? So a couple of things there. Uh, I don't have any calls to read out. We don't have any calls to read out to you on any recent conversation that the president has had with the family. As you know, um, uh, the Sunday after uh, after the horrific shooting, uh, the president and the first lady went to Uvalde. I think some of you may have uh, have have, uh, have gone with us, traveled with us to Uvalde, and listened uh, to the families and hear uh, hear you know hear their stories about their loved one who was uh, who were killed. And it was um, it was a heavy heavy moment. Uh, it was a certainly something devastating to have to. Um, uh, for any parent to have experience. And so, uh, and um, you know, when it comes to tomorrow, you can certainly expect that the president, the first lady, and, and the vice president uh, are going to mark that tragic day. Uh, and uh, we'll have certainly more to share later today or early tomorrow on what that looks like. Look, the families of these 19 children and two teachers, uh, the 17 others who were injured, the entire community that is still mourning, uh, they are in the president's prayers. Um, and so, you know, the president also was able to, he wrote an op-ed uh, in USA Today where he marked the twin shootings uh, in Buffalo and Uvalde and talked about how he believed those, uh, those uh, attacks became a catalyst for the passage of the Bi Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And while he's very, um, he's very uh, appreciative of what Congress was able to do, there's so much more to be done. Uh, we need to do. We need to see Congress do something more. Do more. Put forward some common sense uh, gun reform. That's what these families deserve. Uh, that's what they should uh, be able to see. Uh, and uh, again, you know, it was a, a tragic, tragic day. Uh, you know, guns is certainly an epidemic in this country. It's the number one killer of our kids in America. And the president's going to continue to ask Congress uh, to take more action. On the debt ceiling, uh, Mitch McConnell has said that everyone needs to relax. That this is not an unusual process. Does the president agree with that? Well, what's unusual is uh, is for our economy, the American economy, to be held hostage and to be uh, connected in this way to the budget 
uh, process. And uh, we do not uh, default. Uh, we do not, uh, we are not a deadbeat uh, nation. We've been very clear about that. Uh, you know, we should not be headed towards a, a, a direction where we would default for the first time. But I will also say, uh, both the President and Speaker McCarthy said that default is off the table. So that is, that is productive. That is a, a step forward and a very important thing uh, to note. And so uh, we're going to continue to ask Congress to act and to get this done and to lift the de debt limit. And does the White House see any potential in negotiating short-term rates? Uh, that is something that both the Speaker and we have said is, uh, the Speaker has been very clear that is not on the table. Uh, and so we're going to continue to, to get this done in a way that should be done, right, which is Congress to act and to deal with the debt limit. Thanks, Karine. To follow up on the 14th Amendment again, the last time the President spoke about this in Hiroshima, he actually said that he was looking at the 14th Amendment and he thought that he did have the authority, but the question was essentially whether it would get tangled up in court in appeals. And he said, that's what is unresolved. So has the White House determined that there is not enough time to invoke the 14th Amendment? So look, the 14th Amendment, as I've been saying, doesn't solve our, our problems. Congress must act. The President actually has said that multiple times. And understandably, the President uh, gets it, right? He knows that any action uh, uh, needs to be uh, strongly supported by the law. And I think that's what you heard from the President. Uh, and um, look. I'm certainly not going to get into legal uh, opinions from here. That is not something that I'm going to do from here. But again, it doesn't, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't solve the problem that we have now. But the last time we heard from the president, it was still on the table. Is it on or off the table? The president also said on Sunday that it's up to lawmakers. This is up to lawmakers. And so Congress, again, must do what it's done since 1960, 78 times, which is deal with the debt limit uh, and make sure that we are not a deadbeat nation. That is something that he said as well. But understandably, the president wants, uh, wants any action to be strongly uh, supported by the law. And that's what you heard from the president. But he's also said, reiterated many times, it doesn't solve our problems and Congress needs to act. You said today that negotiations are hard and they take time. Did the president wait too long to engage with the Republicans on the negotiations that he's in the middle of right now? The president has been engaging or trying to engage with Republicans for months now, for months. He put out his budget on March 9th. You all, you, you, you've heard us talk about this. You've heard us lay it out. You've seen the budget, what the president laid out on March 9th. You know, and uh, Republicans passed their, uh, their budget plan at the end of April. And then days later, that's when negotiation, budget negotiation started. And so we've been clear for the past five months how important it is uh, for Congress to act, for Congress to do their constitutional duty. That is the debt ceiling. At the time he dismissed the idea, he said it would be irresponsible to do so. Given where we are, given the risks, given all the horrible things that potentially could happen, does the president still believe that there ought to be a law that caps the nation's statutory so look, borrowing I, Honestly, I'm just not going to get into that right now. Right now, what is uh, the most, the urgency, that the urgent nature that we see in front of us is getting uh, this debt limit done, it's, which is making sure Congress does its, does its constitutional duty and do something that has been done 78 times since 1960. That is what's urgent. That's what uh, the American people deserve, uh, and that's what should be happening. One of the things he said yesterday in the Oval Office is uh, if there is a deal, the challenge that both leaders will face is selling it to their respective constituencies and their parties. Mm -hmm. Has there, can you describe the outreach that's currently underway between the White House and congressional Democrats? So I'm not going to get into private conversations, but clearly our team here, Office of Ledge Affairs and other, uh, other offices in the, in the administration, and uh, along with um, the congressional leaders, have been in touch uh, with, uh, with members and with certain teams, clearly, uh, in Congress, that those conversations uh, will continue, uh, that, that outreach will continue. I'm just not going to read out those private conversations. Uh, but that's what I said. I said negotiations are hard, right? They are, it is democracy in action is what we're seeing currently right now. And uh, just as long both sides understand that neither is going to get exactly what they want, we can get to a bipartisan, reasonable budget agreement. That's what we're working towards. That's what you're seeing um, from the White House negotiation team. That's what you're seeing uh, from the president. Just as long this keeps continuing to move in a good faith effort. 
Yeah. Okay. I'll come to the back after. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the tone in the last few days has been very respectful between the White House and McCarthy's team. You just said a few moments ago that <coughs> McCarthy's team is working in good faith. But this morning you had House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries slamming MAGA Republicans for dangerous default gamesmanship. Uh, you had Pete Aguilar saying McCarthy's beholden to the most extreme members of his party. So is House Democratic leadership undermining the work of the administration right now? Not at all. We are uh, we are in line aligned with them, uh, with the with the leadership on both the House and the Senate, and uh, and that continues. And we have been aligned with them for the past several months. Does Jeffries speak for the party here? Uh, I believe he's the leader of the of the uh, Democratic Caucus on the House, so I would presume that is a yes. So it, it just seems like there's a, a bit of a divide between the rhetoric that he's using and the rhetoric we're hearing out of the White House. Look, I think multiple things could happen at the same time. Clearly, uh, 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 Leader uh, Jeffries is a is a partner in this, has been a partner as long as well as uh, Leader Schumer. That will continue, uh, and uh, and I'll just leave it there. I'm going to go to back. Is that at all a signal that? House Democrats doubt the president's ability to lead the country to a solution here. Well, that's an extreme um, analysis or, or uh, uh, final kind of uh, uh, analysis there. I, I would say uh, if you look at what the president has done the last two years and the leadership that he has shown in passing historic pieces of legislation, bringing uh, uh, the Democrats uh, together in passing uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, when he brought the, the Democrats together to pass his first legislation, which is the American Rescue Plan that helped get the economy back on its feet, that is a president that has led. That is a president that has continued to lead. You look at the economy, the economy has been able to uh, create 12.7 million jobs. It's been able to see an unemployment rate at one of the lowest that we have seen uh, in modern time. And that's going to continue if we are continue to do the work of the American people, get this bu budget negotiation uh, done. And uh, and here, that's at stake. The work that this president has done, that is what's at stake right now. So this tradition I, that would be like an end run around what the president is doing. Well, absolutely not. Look, I would I would um, refer you to Congress on their processes and what they're trying to do in Congress. But to say to say or suggest the president's leadership is in question, I think is completely false. I disagree with that with that premise and certainly with that question because if you look at the last two years, if you look at what Democrats have been able to, to get done with the leadership of this president, that is the complete opposite of what you just laid out. Go ahead, April. Uh, two topics. On the debt ceiling, you were strategic last week in saying it was conversation, it was a, there were a series of conversations versus negotiations. That is now turned. When did that wording change, and why? And what is uh, the sticking point within these, or what are the sticking points, if you will, in these negotiations? Can you say that one more time? What's changed? You were saying what's changed? We're very strategic in yeah. saying they're not negotiations; they're conversations. Well, I've always said, um, I've always said that budget. It is we are negotiating on the budget. I've always been very clear about that. I said that default is not negotiable. That's what I've said. I said the fault is not negotiable, uh, but that uh, you know the president has always seen this as diff separate, two separate conversations, two separate discussions, and we are we are indeed been negotiating on the budget. That's what you've seen from uh, from from uh, from the outcome of these conversations, and that's what you're continue to see. Officially, have you begun the negotiations? When did the negotiations actually start? Well, once the once the House right was able, the Republicans in the House were able to pass their budget plan. I think I believe it was April 26. The president invited five days later. The, the president sat down with the leaders and they started having conversations. Uh, and then after that, you saw the budget teams announced. Uh, budget, budget negotiation teams announced, and you've seen and you've all have reported what's been happening uh, for the past several days. Okay. Second topic, uh, the NAACP has made um, a move, uh, a travel advisory for the state of Florida after uh, several issues against the other, if you will, uh, from Governor Ron DeSantis. Um, and they're saying that the hate that is coming out of this political season is dangerous. What do you say to what the NAACP has done? I mean, they're following behind other groups, be it uh, groups on race or LGBTQ+, plus, but they're making a bold statement. What do you say to this? So I'm not going to, uh, to comment on travel advisories specifically, but I'll say this more broadly and where we have been as an administration, as a White House, we've been outspoken. 
uh, about the impact of misguided policies advanced by uh, Florida uh, uh, lawmakers. Republicans in, in Florida have uh, attacked diversity. They've uh, attacked inclusion efforts. Uh, they've limited the teaching of black history. And they've uh, launched attacks on the LGBT youth, immigrants, educators, and women's reproductive freedom. That's what you have seen uh, from uh, lawmakers in Florida. So I'll let NAACP, I'll let uh, LULAC speak to their specific uh, uh, specifics of their travel advisories. But this administration is going to, as we have for the past two years, continue uh, to speak out against discriminatory uh, policies uh, pushed by state, state leaders across the country. And we've seen them across the country uh, by, uh, by Republicans, uh, extreme Republicans, putting forth uh, these, these, um, these policies, this legislation uh, that hurt Americans, that take away their freedom. And so, again, we're going to continue to be outspoken. That's what we believe uh, it is our duty uh, to do here. That's what the President believes. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, continue to call this out. Thank you. Uh, in a closed hearing today, a Russian court extended the pretrial detention of the Wall Street Journal's Evan Grishkovich until at least August 30th. Uh, what is the White House's response to that decision, and can you provide any updates on the administration's efforts to secure Evan's release? So we are deeply uh, concerned that uh, Russia has extended the pretrial detention of Evan Grishkovich by an additional uh, three months today. Uh, we have been very clear uh, that the claims against him are, are baseless. Russia should release Evan and Paul Whelan uh, immediately, and we'll continue to be very clear on that point. On another topic, China has settled ban big companies from buying Micron's chips. Why does the White House believe the PRC decided to take this step, and does the White House view it as the kind of economic coercion that G7 leaders condemned and denounced in Japan? So, look, the, the recent announcement by the PRC regarding Micron, we believe, are, are not, base, uh, not based in fact. And so the Department of Commerce is engaged directly with the PRC to detail our views on this. Uh, we are tr we're certainly troubled by the action and the recent raids and targeting of uh, American, uh, American firms, American companies. Uh, these actions are inconsistent with the PRC's uh, assertions that it is uh, opening its markets and committed to a transparent regulatory uh, framework. Uh, so those conversations are certainly, of our views, are certainly being communicated uh, to the PRC via the Department of Commerce. Okay. To the back. Okay. All right. To the back. Yeah, yeah. I'm right over here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I see you. You see me. Let's not play. Right? Let's not. Okay, Mr. Two Wit. Let's go. What do oh, you got? Uh, all right. I promise not to use that phrase. Again. <laughs> um, do you Social media loved it, though. <laughs> do you mean to tell us that in the discussions between the president and the speaker, and in the discussions between the two negotiating teams, they are only discussing? Uh, federal discretionary spending, and that they are not at all discussing the terms under which the debt ceiling would be raised? What I can tell you is uh, what you've heard uh, from the President, what you've heard uh, from both sides, uh, which has been the negotiation has certainly been about the budget. You've heard them talk about the budget. You've heard them talk about uh, uh, how we're moving forward, and that in this particular moment that we're in, they've been productive. Uh, the, pr the President has held the, the line and has been very clear that the debt, uh, when it comes to the debt limit, it should be done uh, without negotiations, without condition. That's something that the President has said uh, in front of all of you, and well, he I also said, in the actual I just, I just told you. They're not talking about the debt ceiling, about I how just long it would be raised, by how much. I, That's not I, a subject I, of discussion? Well, first of all, I, I am telling you what the President has said to all of you. Said. I follow okay. it very closely okay. every day. Well, I want well, to know then, what's happening in that room. I'm, the president has spoken to what he has said to the leaders in that room, to what he has said to Speaker McCarthy in the room, and he's been very clear. And so he has said, when it comes to the debt limit, it is not negotiable. It should be done without conditions. That's what he has said, that he has been very clear. But when it, up to that in these talks? Well, I will also remind you that yesterday the Speaker and the President said, when it comes to default, it is off the table. And I'll leave it there. Okay, let's keep going. Go ahead, Alex. I haven't seen you in a while. Hi, Karim. Um, Democratic mayors in Chicago and New York are just straining to house, you know, humanely the migrants coming north from, uh, you know, Texas primarily. And uh, it seems, at least in New York, they've, they've run out of solutions. They seem really desperate. Uh, it seems like Chicago is more or less in the 
more or less in the same boat. You know, they pleaded for more help from the federal government. I mean, what, do you, what do you have to say to the mayors there? So look, uh, we, we just announced very recently that over $200 million uh, dollars, uh, to support cities uh, this month. And uh, we'll soon be awarding an additional $360 million. Uh, so we take this very seriously. Uh, and we would, of course, like to be able to provide more than that. But this is something that Congress needs to, uh, to, give, it, to give it to us first to actually deal with that. But again, $200 million that we've just announced, another $360, uh, $360 million that we're going to uh, announce additionally to help these cities that you just laid out. Uh, but in, in the meantime, I, I would note that the number of unlawful uh, bo uh, border crossing has plummeted since our plan went into full effect uh, just about almost uh, two weeks ago, 10 days ago. And so that's because we put it in plan, uh, we put a plan in place uh, that uh, that dealt with uh, diplomacy, deterrence, and enforcement. That's what we did. And that's what you're seeing when once our plan took an effect, you saw, you actually saw numbers of unlawful border uh, crossings plummet. And so that is important because our, the actions that we've put forward is actually working. When it comes to the cities, we're doing everything that we can. Of course, we would want to do more, uh, but we have to have Congress to act as well. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Is it me or is it the guy behind me? I'm going to take the floor, it. Okay. The floor is yours, Anita, if you want. Um, I'm going to follow up on Sabrina's China question. When the Commerce Secretary meets with their Chinese counterpart in Washington, what are the administration's objectives for this meeting? Should we see this as a sign of a warming up of relations between Washington and Beijing? And you know, are they going to discuss this proposed executive order <coughs> that the president is, is mulling over about preventing American companies? So I'm not. I'm certainly not going to get ahead of of that conversation of that meeting. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a very important uh, conversation. Clearly, a meeting that the Commerce uh, Department is going to have. Uh, what I'll say uh, as it relates to uh, the next steps and other meetings and other travel by cabinet secretaries, uh, we've been very clear when uh, when it is appropriate, uh, we will uh, we'll certainly revisit Secretary Blinken uh, going to China. And we've talked about uh, Commerce Secretary going to China and also uh, Secretary of Treasury going to uh, China as well. But when it's, when the time is right, when we feel like the, it is appropriate, certainly those conversations uh, will continue uh, and we will re-engage on a potential uh, travel, but certainly you're not going to get in, uh, ahead of what's going to be on the agenda or what's going to come out of those meetings. I have a quick Africa question. Uh, an inquiry out of Pretoria finds that indeed uh, a private South African company did supply weapons to Russia. Um, so how does the White House feel about this? What could be the consequences? Are they, is Pretoria going to be receiving an angry phone call or maybe a rap on the knuckles, um, changes to their AGOA status, anything like that? So I'll say this more broadly. I'm not going to speak to an individual uh, company here. But look, Russia is waging a brutal war, as you all have been reporting and you all see, against the people of Ukraine. And uh, we are constantly working uh, to cut off uh, funding for Putin's war machine and to undercut Russia's ability to carry out this conflict. And so, uh, you know, as part of those efforts, we have strongly urged countries not to uh, provide support for Russia's uh, war. Uh, but certainly, I'm not going to uh, get into e either any private diplomatic discussions or pli private companies uh, from here. But we've been very clear on what we have seen uh, Russia do to the to the people of Ukraine. But we've also uh, seen uh, Ukrainian people over the past, and this is something that the president said over the weekend, bravely uh, fight for their freedom. Uh, and so we're going to continue to do everything that we can uh, to give them the assistance uh, that they need uh, to fight for their freedom. So I'll leave it there. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Speaker McCarthy said yesterday uh, in front of the White House that the reason why we are in this problem is because every time Democrats wanted to make a deal, they wanted to make a deal about spending more money. So do you agree with Speaker McCarthy that Democrats have a spending problem? No. To it. <laughs> <laughs> no, to it. Look, um, I'll say this. Uh, the president's budget reduces the deficit, as you, as you know, by nearly $3 tr trillion over 10 years. 
right? This is a president that believes in uh, dealing with the deficit in a real way. That's on top of the $1.7 trillion uh, that the president has been able to reduce the deficit the last two years. So the president takes this very seriously. Uh, he, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, he's proposed reducing the deficit by eliminating tax breaks uh, for carried interest loopholes, retirement uh, for wealthy real estate investors, and cryptocurrency. He's also proposed raise, uh, raising taxes for billionaires, uh, stock buybacks, and big corporations. And let's not forget the big, big, the, the, the subsidies uh, for big pharma and big oil. Uh, for big oil, it costs about $30 billion. For big pharma, uh, it's about $200 billion. That's what it will save. If we were able to, uh, if we able to cut those wasteful uh, spending on subsidies, so the president has laid this out. He's been very clear. Just look at his budget from March 9th. He's laid out how we can cut spending uh, on behalf of the American people uh, and uh, and and American families, and. And that is on top of what he's been able to do the last two years, $1.7 trillion. Now, more recently, he also talked about doing an additional trillion dollars on top of the $3 trillion that he proposed in, in March 9th in his budget. So he's taking this very seriously. Great. Thanks, Karina. Okay, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.